Good afternoon. The next item of business is portfolio questions, and the portfolio questions today is rural affairs and islands. If a member wishes to ask a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button during the relevant question or enter the letter R in the chat function during the relevant question. As ever, I would appreciate uh, short and succinct questions and answers in order to get as many uh, members in as possible. I call question number one, Willie Coffey. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the Regional Food Fund is supporting the promotion and advancement of Scotland's produce. Cabinet Secretary Mary Goujon. The Regional Food Fund plays an important role in supporting regional activities, local community events, networks and other collaborative initiatives with small grants of up to £5,000. And this in turn delivers long-term benefits to Scotland's local food and drink sector. Since its launch in 2018, the Regional Food Fund has provided over £550,000 to 121 projects the length and breadth of Scotland. And the 2022-23 round, which closed for applications on the 9th of May, will provide even more support for great local food initiatives across the country. Willie Coffey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Ayrshire boasts some of the best food that Scotland has to offer. And organisations like the Ayrshire Food Hub and Crossroads in my constituency with a unique farm shop run by the local community are central to showcasing this world-class produce. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my view that organisations such as this are crucial in ensuring that it becomes the norm for all Scots to take a keen interest in their food, valuing it and knowing what constitutes good food as we strive to become a good food nation? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, I absolutely do. And just to say, I absolutely recognise that Ayrshire is indeed an area that's famous for its food. And I know that the Ayrshire Food Hub received nearly £5,000 in January 2020 from the Regional Food Fund. I know that because of the, there was a delay to progress caused by the pandemic, but I'm really just delighted to see that now, we're, as we're emerging from the pandemic over the course of this past couple of years, that it is now successfully operating a cafe, a farm shop, a training kitchen, event space and community garden all with the aim of promoting the best of the area's produce. And the member is absolutely right. It's initiatives like this that are really fundamental in helping us to achieve our vision of being a good food nation in Scotland because the project itself embraces everything that we want to see as part of that, involving the community, showcasing local produce. There's the education and training element, and I wish them every success. Supplementary. Excuse me, Finlay Carson. The Cabinet Secretary, the NFUS uh, called uh, for in March the greater commitment to fund the Sustainable Agricultural Grant Scheme to assist farmers to use resources more efficiently and to temporarily suspend the EFAS component of the 2022 greening requirement to bring additional arable land back into productive use, with a focus on EFA fallow land being used for nitrogen-fixing protein crops. This has not been delivered, despite the fact you have the powers to do so now. When will you rela relax the EFAS uh, rules and where is the extra funding provided through SACGS needed to support farmers and food producers? Cabinet Secretary. In relation to the EFA members, the, uh, the EFA areas which the member has just outlined there, that is a question that I have addressed a number of times in the Chamber today. Because, well, First of all, I want to set out that the Government is clear in its commitment to supporting farmers and crofters to produce more of our food more sustainably. But it is important that we maintain and enhance our efforts and not scale those back when it comes to, to tackling the climate and nature emergency. And I think events that are ongoing in Ukraine just now only strengthen the case for doing more because ultimately that's how we can make our farms and food production systems more resilient. Uh, when it comes to changes to greening, there are a number of considerations in relation to that that we have to take account of. But there are flexibility within the greening rules for farmers to apply them according to their own circumstances. For example, they could choose options other than to fallow, such as green cover crops or catch crops too. But we are working with the industry and we will work with them to promote the flexibilities that are already there. And we will, of course, continue to work with them to find practical solutions to bolster food production in these times of uncertainty while continuing to contribute to wider climate change and biodiversity objectives too. And supplementary, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. This week, the Food Coalition wrote to the First Minister calling for the establishment of an independent food commission to drive forward the change we need to make Scotland a good food nation. We have a land commission, a social security commission, a poverty and inequality commission, a just transition commission. 
But so far, the Cabinet Secretary does not think food policy merits an independent food commission. So will the Cabinet Secretary listen to civil society, local authorities, the majority of MSPs in this Parliament, avoid destroying the consensus we have seen in our journey to become a good food nation and give her back in to an independent food commission? Cabinet Secretary. I do not think it is really fair for the member to categorise it in, in that way, and, and especially my, uh, accusing me of ignoring the calls that are out there, because I think I made it perfectly clear during stage two consideration of the Good Food Nation Bill that I am open to looking at that and looking at the oversight functions. And in fact, the member will be aware that we have uh, a meeting shortly to discuss what that might look like ahead of stage three consideration uh, of, uh, of the Good Food Nation Bill. So, of course, I am open to considering these options and looking at that and trying to build that consensus across the chamber. Uh, before I call question number two, I would just uh, make my plea again for short and succinct questions and indeed answers. Otherwise, I will not be able to get through all the questions. Question number two, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether, following the UK Government's launch of a seafood exports fund, it will launch a Scottish seafood fund. Cabinet Secretary. We already have an established fund in Scotland called the Marine Fund Scotland. And in recognition of the lack of UK government support following Brexit, we funded Seafood Scotland to the tune of £1.8 million in 2021-22 to enable them to carry out export support activity of the kind identical to that now being proposed in the £1 million seafood exports pillar of the UK government's UK Seafood Fund. And it's entirely appropriate that the UK government has belatedly taken responsibility for some of the costs of an imposed Brexit, which inflicted significant and lasting damage to Scottish seafood markets. The £1 million package being offered by the UK government, though, is a paltry amount compared to the real cost of Brexit, and the UK government must also take responsibility for those, as well as honouring its promise to replace lost EU funding in full. Liam Kerr. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for not directly answering my question, but look, the success of seafood exports and indeed food security, which the Cabinet Secretary said recently is as important as energy security, depends on our fishing industry's ability to catch. Now, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation have flagged that recent developments, such as expansion of floating offshore wind, marine generation and associated connections, could have an impact on fishing grounds and the Scottish fleet. So, what steps are being taken to ensure that the future sustainability of our fishing industry in producing climate smart food is not relegated to collateral damage in an increasingly crowded marine environment? Cabinet Secretary. I, well, I'm sorry that the member didn't appear to listen to my first response in answer to his question, which did directly answer it. And in relation to the second point, though, which he does raise, which is a vitally important issue and one which I have discussed with the, with the fishing industry and SFF as well, I would direct him towards our blue economy vision, which sets out what we are looking to achieve for our marine sectors and industries in Scotland and our ambitions for the future, which clearly points to the importance of the fishing industry in Scotland, which produces a, 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 a carbon friend, a neutral and sustainable source of of protein, which is going to be important uh, both now and into the future as well. How we managed our marine resources in what is becoming an ever increasingly uh, cluttered space. I mean, I know that there are a lot of competing interests there that we need to take account of, but we are trying to manage our way through that as best as we can, taking account of all the different interests. A supplementary, Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. £1 million to help exports hardly seems like fair compensation given the utter havoc that the Tories' hard Brexit has wrecked on the fishing and seafood industries. They were completely ignored during the negotiations that brought about the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, and now it seems likely that the Tories will once again throw our fishers and those in the seafood industry under the bus in a trade war with the EU. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my view that this, if this does happen, it will put beyond any doubt the disinterest and contempt that the UK Government has for Scotland's seafood sector? Cabinet Secretary. The funding that has been offered by the UK Government is little more than a sticking plaster when you compare it to the huge costs that have been incurred because of the new trade barriers and avoidable bureaucracy arising from the UK Government's Brexit deal. And ever since the 2016 referendum, successive UK governments have completely mishandled relations with our closest allies and partners in the EU. And the interests of Scotland and its people have suffered grievously as a result of that, and none more so than the Scottish seafood sector itself. And as the European Union External Affairs Secretary had said earlier this week, 
that the UK Government are now intending to legislate to enable unilateral action to disapply parts of the Northern Ireland Protocol is deeply concerning. To breach an international treaty which had been signed in good faith and hailed by the Prime Minister as a fantastic moment is bad enough, but to contemplate that action when facing a cost of living crisis is unthinkable and completely indefensible. Question number three, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting farmers to utilise new technological advances. Minister Lorna Slater. Technology is vital to address the economic and environmental challenges facing the agricultural industry. We continue to offer meaningful technical and financial support in this area. For example, the Farm Advisory Service offers a range of high-quality advice to help facilitate the uptake of technology to maximise profitability and enhance sustainability. Also, technology-based projects have the opportunity to apply for funding through the Knowledge Transfer and Innovation Fund to demonstrate the practical application of technology in agricultural business. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for that answer. On Monday this week, innovation funding was removed from the Scottish Government's environmental, agriculture and food research strategy. Can the Minister explain why that has been and why the funding was removed? And can she reassure farmers that the agri-food industry that the Scottish Government is still committed to supporting innovation in new farming methods and technology. Uh, Minister? The Scottish Government uh, launched the Knowledge Transfer and Innovation Fund, which is exactly for innovation. Uh, in April this year, the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs and Islands opened KTF for applications and offered up to £1.6 million of support for projects looking to support the uptake of technology amongst a broad range of other topics. The application window is now closed, and applications are being assessed for that award. And supplementary, Jenny Minton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On the subject of support for farmers, is it, the, it is the Scottish Government that remains committed to supporting active farming and food production, whilst in other parts of the UK are offering farmers money to leave the industry. Does the Cabinet Secretary therefore share my view that it is the Scottish Government uh, that, the Scottish, that this Scottish Government need to take no lessons from the Tories on how to support Scotland's agricultural sector? Cabinet, uh, Minister. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, thank you for a second. Um, just to remind members, I am in the chair and I will decide what is relevant and what is not. Thank you very much. And I do not appreciate a lot of sed sedentary comments, as I think people will now be aware. Please resume, Minister. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This Government is determined to support a sustainable, vibrant rural economy. We will provide stability to farmers while also supporting them and other land managers and rural stakeholders to deliver our climate change and biodiversity objectives. That is why we are collaborating with the industry through the Agricultural Reform Implementation Oversight Board, which this government set up, and providing a budget of £680 million in 2022-23 in agricultural support and environmental payments, including direct payments, the Scottish Rural Development Programme and agricultural transformation. Question number four, Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing to increase and retain the population in Scotland's islands. Cabinet Secretary. Supporting islands to increase and retain their populations is an ambition across all parts of Scottish Government, as demonstrated by this year's programme for government. Within that, there are a range of commitments that could help to address our population challenges, including the support for the National Islands Plan, as well as national commitments such as developing rural visa pilots and a remote rural and islands housing action plan. Lee MacArthur. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary? The objective of attracting and retaining population in islands and the funding made available are both very welcome, but the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of my concern, as well as uh, many of my Orkney constituents, about the proposed island bond scheme. Will she therefore agree to consider using this funding in ways that make island communities more resilient and offer more employment opportunities for islanders? For example, introducing a third aircraft on Orkney's internal routes using low emissions fuel park funded through green transport innovation funding it would undoubtedly help attract and retain population, not just on one island, but across the Outer Isles in my constituency. Cabinet Secretary. I know that this is an issue that the member has raised concern about previously and again today, but I would just want to again say that the islands bond has never been presented as some sort of silver bullet to address all our island population challenges because it is just one element of our wider work across all of Scottish Government to support islands' communities. 
And the Islands Bond consultation, along with our ongoing engagement, will really try and it will help us to understand the challenges in greater detail. And we will continue to work with local authorities, our island communities and other island stakeholders to try and address these issues. And supplementary, Jamie Halker johnson uh, The ongoing crisis with our ferries continues to impact on individual small businesses and agricultural sector. As well as har uh, harming existing residents and businesses, this has made our islands less attractive places to live, work and do business. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, has she made any serious assessment of the economic impact of the ongoing issues with ferry routes connecting our islands? Cabinet Secretary. I mean, just want to uh, again reiterate, uh, just as I was saying about the islands bond there, we know that this is a multifaceted issue and we know that the problems uh, that our island communities experience, whether that's in relation to transport and to housing, so it's about how we tackle all of these issues in the round. The member will no doubt be aware of the £580 million investment we have planned over the course of the next five years and also the work that's ongoing in relation to the island's connectivity plan, a draft of which will be published towards the end of the year and will address some of these problems. Problems. Question number five, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to remote and rural communities in the Lovian region. Cabinet Secretary. In the previous leader-funded programme, the Tyne-esque area covering Mid and East Lothian was allocated £3.5 million and West Lothian £2.1 million over the course of the six-year programme. In 2021-22, Scottish Government made available over £100,000 of funding ring-fenced for rural communities in the Tyne-esque and West Lothian area. And over £360,000 will also be made available this financial year to continue that valuable community-led work in rural communities across Tyne-esque and West Lothian. Jeremy Balfour. I can thank the Cabinet Secretary for answer. Support in Mind Scotland believe that there needs to be increased opportunity to talk about mental health and wellbeing in non-medical environments such as clubs, venues and meeting places. A light model of social prescribing should be adopted where individuals are informed of support or opportunities within their community to tackle loneliness. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit to exploring this approach to support those in rural communities, especially within my region? Cabinet Secretary. I'm more than happy to look at any initiatives that, that can help in terms of offering that support. And I know that people are under a lot of pressure right now, particularly in our rural communities. And this is a matter on which I'm happy to engage with the member further. And supplementary, Fiona Hislop. Is the, cabinet, uh, sorry, is the Minister aware that many of my constituents in the Linlithgow constituency in Lothian living in rural and remote communities rely on LPG and oil heaters in off-grid homes, with prices for home heating oil increasing by as much as 126%. Households who rely on heating oil are not currently subject to off-gems price cap, leaving them vulnerable to uncontrolled price increases. They face a very difficult winter. So can the, minister, sorry, can the Cabinet Secretary commit to working with Cabinet colleagues to identify what specific immediate support can be made available to those individuals uh, in rural and remote areas, many of whom are elderly and are on fixed incomes. I am more than happy to commit to that uh, because I know that heating oil and LPG consumers are facing significant increases in their energy costs. Uh, of course, energy pricing and the powers in relation to that are reserved, meaning that the Scottish Government can act to provide additional protection for these consumers. But we have engaged with the UK Government to raise these concerns about the recent unprecedented rises in heating fuel costs for off-gas grid customers in parts of Scotland, as well as stressing the urgent need for protections for these consumers. But nonetheless, we are doing everything that we can with the powers that we do have to assist those worst affected and have recently allocated a further £10 million to our fuel and security fund. That fund is delivered through trusted third sector partners, including the Fuel Bank Foundation and Advice Direct Scotland, who administer our home heating support fund. And I would urge those in need of that support to please get in touch with these organisations. Question number six, Jim Fairley. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer. I would like to ask the Scottish Government what engagement it has had with the UK Government regarding the continuing delays to post-Brexit border checks on imports from the European Union. Um, I actually, I, I, I'm looking at the actual wording of the question on the business bulletin and just to remind members that uh, that actual wording must be read out into the record. So could I ask Mr Fairley to please uh, uh, read out the actual question as it appears on the business bulletin and uh, I hope that he has that to hand and if not perhaps a kind member, Mr Stewart, could assist. Thank you very much, Mr Stewart. 
Mr Fairley, could you please read out the question as it appears on the business My sincere Thank you. apologies. I am not quite sure how I got that mixed up. Um, I'd like to ask the Scottish Government what engagement it has had with the UK Government regarding the impact on agriculture in the food and drink sector in Scotland of the report of continuing delays to post-Brexit border checks on imports from the EU. Thank you, Thank you Mr Fairley. Cabinet Secretary. On the 28th of April 2022, the UK Government made an announcement on further delays to the introduction of controls on imports from the EU without any consultation or meaningful engagement with the Scottish Government, failing to use any of our channels of communication. This kind of conduct just isn't acceptable. And on the 4th of May, I wrote to George Eustace expressing my deep frustration and concern regarding the continuation of biosecurity risks and the uneven playing field between Scottish importers and exporters following this latest delay. And I've urged the UK Government to begin meaningful dialogue on future borders policy. Jim Fairley. I'd like to get, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Recently, the NFUS President Martin Kennedy spoke in scathing terms of the prolonged failure of the UK Government regarding exports to Europe and how this showed an astonishing level of incompetence and failure to support the Scottish producers and our food and drink sector. Yesterday at the RAIN Committee, I put this view to, Cabinet Se uh, to Mr. Uh, George Eustace, who cited the potential to exacerbate the cost of living crisis as the reason that the UK Government is giving for continued delays. Given that Brexit has been a driver of the cost of living crisis in the first place, does the Cabinet Secretary share my utter bewilderment at the UK Government using a crisis largely of its own making as a reason for not fixing a shambles that is also of their own making? Cabinet Secretary. The UK Government's announcement is the fourth delay to import checks on goods from the EU since Brexit, and for every delay, the UK Government have continued to ignore the, unevil pl the uneven playing field that exists between our Scottish importers and exporters. Now, we've written repeatedly to the UK Government to highlight uh, concerns around the effects of its bad Brexit deal. And just last week, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance wrote to the UK Chancellor, highlighting the damaging effects of this delay on multiple sectors, including specifically on our food and drink sector. And the food and drink sector in Scotland and the UK has borne the brunt of the hard Brexit deal pursued by the UK Government, and particularly through the loss of uh, freedom of movement and free trade. And I also uh, touched on the very real biosecurity risks that are presented by this in, in my opening response. And I actually met with Paul McLennan in one of his constituents, who's a pig farmer. I spoke to other pig farmers who are all seriously concerned about the devastating impact of diseases like African swine fever and, and the impact that can have if it reaches our shores. So I only wish that these concerns were treated as seriously as what they need to be. Question number seven, Alistair Allen. <clears throat> To ask the Scottish Government how many grants have been awarded through the Croft House Grant Scheme in the Western Isles since 2007. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has a track record of investing to improve Croft housing. Since 2007, we have approved over £23.6 million in Croft House grant payments, helping to build and improve over 1,085 Croft homes. Of these, 526 grants have been awarded to recipients in the Western Isles, with a total grant award of over £11 million, or around 47 per cent of all grants approved. Alistair Allen. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very helpful answer. The Croft House Grant Scheme is an excellent method of helping crofters with the costs of housing and retaining families in island communities. So, Does the Cabinet Secretary have uh, any view on whether the uh, astronomical recent rises we have seen in the cost of building materials uh, may need to be taken into account in the scheme going forward. Cabinet Secretary. I, yes, I do. Um, the UK Government holds most of the levers to address the pressures on the cost of living, uh, but the Scottish Government is providing support where we can to really ensure that all uh, people that live in rural areas and communities and businesses are given as much support as possible to deal with the rising uh, issues. Now, Croft House grants can be used towards a new build or towards house improvements, which I agree provides helpful support for crofters and the wider crofting communities. But I think it's also important to remember that this can be used in conjunction with the Self-Build Loan Fund 2, which offers loans of up to £175,000 to eligible applicants for development costs to support build completion of a new house. And supplementary, Rachel Hamilton. Presiding officer, let's be clear. The fund that Mary Goujon is talking about, the Croft House Grant, grant paid out £6.2 million out of a total designated £11 million. That is vital funding for crofters, for new entrants, for people to upgrade their houses and make them energy efficient. Cabinet Secretary, is not it about time that you supported croft, uh, crofting communities? And when will the crofting uh, reform come forward uh, in a Cabinet decision? Cabinet Secretary. 
I, well, first of all, I just want to address Rachel Hamilton's first point there and actually highlight how the Croft Housing Grant Scheme works. Because it is a demand-led scheme and no scheme application has ever been refused because of a, a, a lack of budget. And funding for the Croft House Grant Scheme is pro provided retrospectively in up to three stages too. So for that reason, funding that is committed in any financial year will actually be claimed by applicants and paid in both the current and following two to three financial years. Um, and I would say that the scheme as it is has, de has been developed following extensive engagement with key stakeholders. I have said it in the Chamber before, I have said it to, in committee to the member as well, that we have made a commitment that we will be looking to reform crofting law, but of course that depends on the, the decisions that are taken uh, by the Parliament itself in terms of the, the legislative timetable. But we have committed to that and have every intention of delivering on that commitment. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions on rural affairs and islands, and I apologise for not being able to reach number eight. However, I did indicate on several occasions that that was what I feared would come to pass, and it did. Uh, there will now be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you.